Thanks for joining me today for episode 81 of Think Big with Michael Zellner, all positive, no politics. My guest today is Jamie and Christian. Jamie is the former head basketball coach at Mount St. Mary's, Siena and George Washington University. He graduated from Mount St. Mary's in 2004 with a degree in rhetoric and communications. Jamie was the 2000 Virginia Class A Player of the Year and led New Kent High School to a 26-0 record and a state championship. He's also the host of the podcast, Last Call with Jamie and Christian. Welcome to the show, Coach. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Well, you know, um, I come from a really small town in New Kent, Virginia. Um, and so people often think when you're a country boy that you're, you know, that you're not as quick witted as some others. But, you know, I think you just see the world differently. Uh, you have a chance to grow up with people that are always looking out for you. So your your perspective on how to interact with people is different. You know, like I, I always see the real, I see really, see the really good in people. I really enjoy that kind of process, seeing the good in people. Um, and so I would say that I would start there. I would always tell people this, I'm much tougher than you think. You know, sometimes when you when you speak clearly and you're caring and you're loving, people take that as a as a sign that you're not really uh, tough. But I think when you're a country boy, you grow up pretty tough, and you learn how to do tough things, how to make those tough things look easy. Yeah, I can relate to that because you know ha having a a big heart and wearing my heart on my sleeve like I do, and I, I always say I don't apologize for it, and it's the way I was brought up, how my dad was. Um, the people sometimes perceive that as weakness, but it's not, it, it does definitely, in my opinion, makes you stronger. Well, I mean, for me, it's like, it's like everything for me. It's everything to be able to know who I am as a person. Um, you know, nothing in my life is given to me. You know, a lot of times, I mean, you probably interview some people or you know, a lot of times you have people that are successful and have been successful. They have this whole like family lineage of how they got there. Right. Uh, you know, my dad was a tremendous, he was a, he was a travel with the United States tra uh, track and field team for several years. Um, he's really successful in that field, but he's not, a, he's not a hall of fame basketball head coach. And, you know, my brother and I, we, you know, we kind of found our way in this basketball thing from the ground up. You know, there's not a whole lot of guys from New Kent, Virginia that are, that have had the opportunity to do what, what I've been able to do. And I'm really proud of that. You know, I, I'll tell you this, Michael, I always say like, you know, a self-made man can never be broken because he built himself from the ground up. You know, you have a lot of guys out there who are not self-made that have been right. kind of propped up. Um, I'm not one of those guys. And I'm really proud of that. Yeah. I mentioned that you played high school basketball in New Kent, which you just mentioned your hometown. You know, what was so special about the Charles City New Kent game? Well, it, you know, it's, it's a rivalry. It's been a rivalry for forever, not just the game. You know, you look at Charles City, um, which was founded by, by, by free blacks. You look at New Kent, which, which had a ton of slaves. Um, so the history of the counties goes way further than just high school basketball or high school football. Um, for me personally, you know, my family and my mother is from Charles City. My dad teaches and coaches at Charles City and my mom taught in New Kent and we lived in New Kent. So what makes it really special is that you know, you're interacting with people that you're seeing every single day when you go to the rec center, when you go to the family cookout, when you go to church. So that makes it, you know, and, and it's actually separated by a railroad track, most of it. So it's just like these two different, you know, it's, it's, it was one of the most fun games that you always look up to. And you know, when you're a kid and, you know, you're going to uh, the games, like this is the game you're going to go to. It's a sellout game every single year. There's no tickets left. If you, if the game's on Saturday, and you don't get your tickets by Friday morning, there's no chance you're going to be able to get in unless you know somebody. Um, it's just one of the most fun games you're going to have a chance to be in. And, you know, it's a game where you can't really make yourself. You know, people are, you know, if you win that game, and uh, you score the most points, you have the most blocks or, or dunk on somebody, you know, they're going to be talking about it for a long period of time. It's where if you want to become a legend, you got to perform well in that game. You know, you can play poorly the rest of the year. But if you play well in those games, everyone's going to celebrate you and celebrate your success. So obviously you won that game your senior year since you guys went 26 and 0. So that must have been an extra special thing for you too. Yeah, we we never lost to Charles City. Oh, okay. Uh, from cool. JV to varsity, uh, we did not lose to them. I guess we went probably, you know, 10 or 10 or 11 and 0 on them. And they had some really good teams. Uh, my dad again, my dad was there. Um, so I knew the I knew the players really well. I mean, they were in his classes and you know, they were sending notes through him to me um, the, the week of the game and. You know, it's just a great environment to be a part of. 
But, you know, you want to be at your very best when your best is required, and you do that in those kind of rivalry games. You learn that at a really young age. You know, I'll tell you this, which is, people definitely don't know this. And my dad used to do the PA announcing for the Charles City basketball games. Um, and so when I was a kid, uh, I would get a chance at halftime to go and shoot free throws out there. And, you know, I always remember those, like, my first moments of, going out there shooting free throws and shoot, sometimes they boo you. you right. If you miss one, you get a little boo. Um, and so I just really enjoyed going out there. It's really the first time I remember being out in a pressure situation, um, really feeling nervous and, and anxious. And I'm really proud to say, you know, since that day, I, I, you know, since I was a kid, you know, I never felt anxious or nervous at a game. I felt like I got over that at a really young age, you know, certainly using that, that, that ability to be in there and in those great environments. Now you, you played for legendary coach uh, Jim Phelan at Mount St. Mary's, who has the 14th most wins in NCAA history with 830. You were a three-year captain there. What what are some of your best memories of those years? I mean, you know, New Kent made me. Mount shined me up. Uh, you know, the word after that kind of got me going. And But you know, those, those two places that you're hitting on really really put me in a great place to, to be the person that I am today. Uh, you know, Coach Phelan – he was really underrated. You know, he's in the College Basketball Hall of Fame, but he's actually not in the Naismith Hall of Fame. He's not in the the bigger Hall of Fame, which I think is such a tragedy. You have a guy who coached for 49 years, and in the 49 years that he coached, I mean, the country changed so many times. I mean, I was in Washington, D.C. for three years, and the country changed, and I didn't make it out of there, right? So I don't know how he did it over 49 years with how many times I changed. I mean, there were several wars, several different uh, things happening in politics during his time period. The integration of Mount St. Mary's itself happened while he was there. I mean, he just coached through so ma- so much so much adversity through the years. So the first thing when you say that is I just have so much respect for him. You know, being a being a, a head coach for a long period of time, being a guy that played for him, the level of respect that I have for him is immense because his job couldn't have been easy. And he found a way to be really successful doing it all. Uh, you know, coach was a guy – and, you know, sadly, he passed away about two years ago, but he was a guy and our relationship had so many different transitions, right? You come in as a player and he's your coach. He's a legendary head coach. He's the guy telling you where to go, dictating your playing time. But then I got a chance to watch as I grew up as a player and, and he and he continued to grow as a coach where he was my coach, telling me what to do and where to be, holding me accountable. Um, but then, you know, as I got older, your relationship changes. It was much more, I don't want to say we were friends, but I want to say we were much more connected on things that we could talk about. Our, our scope of what we could connect about was different. And then I got, I was so fortunate. I came back as a head coach at 29 years old and I got coach Phelan, you know, I got coach Phelan coming to my office once a week, taking me to lunch and just making sure that I was ready for that opportunity. You know, he was a guy that when the job came open, uh, like I wasn't going to take the job. You know, like I wasn't going to take the job. I was at VCU. We had, a, you know, we, we were really good. We won 29 wins, the most in VCU history. Uh, lost, in a round of, lost in a round of 32 on a Will Sheehy short baseline jumper. Uh, and that's in Indiana to the Sweet 16. And, you know, I, I'm on the flight. And I get a call right before I get on the plane from, from Lynn Phelan Robinson, the AD. And, and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to take the job, and she convinces me to come and see it, and, and I go up there, and she takes me to Coach's house. So, you know, and so Coach kind of closes me out on it because, you know, I thought it was a legacy move for him. You know, he would love, he wanted to have a guy that played for him, that was sort of taking over the mantle. You know, we had Milan Brown before, you know, that replaced him. We had someone in the middle and then me. Um, And so our relationship was different because when I got there, he was just really, really caring. And, and I'll tell you a story. You know, we play LIU Brooklyn. And LI, LIU Brooklyn at the time had gone to two NCAA tournaments in a row, really a dominant team in the NEC. And we go and play them, and they beat us pretty solid. And I'm in the office. And I'm, in, I'm sitting in the office, and I'm like, you know, as a coach, you're going through it every day, trying to figure out, like, what can we do better? And, you know, just the whole thing. And I was, like, in a place, a bad place. And he comes in the office, he sits down, and I kind of notice him, and 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 he goes, you all right? And I was like, oh, I'm all right. And he goes, sometimes, champion, they're a lot better than you are, <laughs> you know? And, and, I, and I always say that story because it speaks to a little bit of our uniqueness of our relationship. 
you know, if we weren't so close, if he wasn't my coach, I might have felt offended. Right. Right. But he said it and it was exactly what I needed to hear to snap me out of whatever I was in. And I was like, you know what, coach, you're right. They are. And he goes, but you're going to figure out a way to beat them. And the next time we played them, we beat them like 15 or 16. We beat them pretty good. Sweet. Um, and, and it just goes to speak about just coaching and how many, you know, he could have said that in a thousand different ways, but he knew exactly the way to reach me in that moment and creates a little bit of laughter. And that's how I always remember coach is having that ability to say what was needed in the moment, no matter what, no matter what was needed to be said. And there's not a lot of people that are really good at that. I mean, I don't know how, I don't, to this day, I don't know how he did it. I mean, it was exactly what I needed to hear. I was in such a place like, you know, I was mad at our team, mad at our coaches and, and he just hit it. He hit me square on the nose and it was exactly what I needed to hear. And, And so much of coaching is that so much of coaching is the conversation that's, that's happening. And can you get your point across in the conversation? Um, and then he took me to lunch. We had a great lunch and, and it was, and it was great, but I, I'm so blessed to have played for him and to play for a man who really cared about me, cared about my family and, and, um, and ultimately wanted to make sure that I was successful. Um, again, we went to the NSA tournament twice while he was still with us and he was more excited, uh, than maybe when he won it. And he was just happy to be in that moment with us. And, you know, again, uh, I, I stand on a place now where I've, I've had a lot of success in my career. Um, I've got a lot more ahead, but uh, I've been blessed to be with some really great people. Coach Phelan's one of those people. So you were an assistant coach before that from 2004 to 2012, you know, with your last stint that you just mentioned, 2011-12, you know, for a VCU team that was head coach uh, was Chaka Smart at the time. And you said of him, quote, There is no one in this life like you. You've had a ton of success and so much more is ahead of you. But what people don't realize about you is how much you live your life for love and care of others. I watch you change people's lives. There was no one better at taking someone from point A to point B and making them feel like they had the power to do that the whole entire time. Unquote. What's the most important thing that he taught you, coach? Well, you know, as a black head coach, you know, he, he taught me how to use how to be me. You know, I mean, so much of this game or so much of learning, I should say this game and talk about learning in general is what you see, what's around you, the lessons you're able to learn, the lessons someone's able to share. You know, my lessons are different than maybe a a white head coach's lessons may be. Um, And so watching him interact with our players, watching him be himself, a thousand percent genuinely himself to those guys and watching those guys grab, you know, really like uh, connect with him on that level was, was amazing to watch. And I don't think I would have been able to do that before. I think I would have been a much more rigid head coach had I not watched him. Um, You know, he coaches with so much joy. He loves coaching the game. He loves competing with the players. He loves being there with them. I love that. And I don't think I would have had that joy coaching if I didn't see him coach that way, which is kind of scary. You know, I was playing pickup yesterday at, at 830 in the morning. Like it was game seven of the finals, laughing and joking and having a great time. And this game has given us all so much. It's given us a platform to share. It's given us education. It's given us great friends and family. It's given us so much. It's given us a competitive place to play and to be able to use our talents. It should be celebrated and enjoyed. And so watching him celebrate and enjoy it every single day, uh, I'm not saying I try to emulate that because I believe in being myself, but for me watching him do that, it gave me the confidence that that could work, that I could be who I am and I could laugh and joke and have fun and, and attack it and be competitive. And, you know, so many, you know, so many things in life, they, people want you to be one thing or the other. And the truth of it is, in our personalities were, were many things all, all happening at once. So to be a genuine leader and be a person who can lean on that whenever it's needed, it's fun to watch. And it was fun to be a part of. And, and, and so I'm eternally grateful to his presence on my life um, as a friend, as a leader, as a coach. 
you know, you mentioned just a few minutes ago, you were only 29 freaking years old in 2012 when you were hired to become head coach at Mount St. Mary's, your alma mater. What, when all that happened and you actually got the job and everything like that, what was going through your mind at the time? Well, I knew I was prepared. Um, you know, I have really, I have a lot of confidence in myself as a person, as a leader. And I think when you, when I say that, it doesn't mean, you know, like they make the big thing about Bill Belichick coming in at, you know, when he went with the, when he went, when, when he met with the Cleveland Browns and he had this huge plan about how they're going to be successful. And, you know, the players need to be between this age and this height and all these things. And I think a plan is great. I love planning. So I'm not saying a plan isn't important, but I think they hire you because you got the ability to figure out how to get the job done. You know, whether that plan is perfect or not usually doesn't happen. Right. Um, you know, and, and so I, I felt like I had the ability to get the job done and to kind of figure it out. You know, I had, a, I had an advantage. I'd been there before, so I knew what worked there and I knew what didn't work there. I knew the league fairly well. Um, but, you know, my biggest thing was I just wanted to make sure I did a great job and that we got ourselves back to the top of the NEC, which we were able to do over that six-year span. We had the best record in the NEC play. Um, we just wanted to have a competitive, fast, aggressive team that played connected basketball, that loved one another, that inspired our fans to do the same thing. And I felt like we did that, um, you know, and you do that through just a tremendous amount of love. And that love's got to start with the leader. So I wanted to come in day one and set the tone that we were going to work hard, but we we're going to love each other. And we had a group of guys that really bought into that right away. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of success because of that. You said, quote, you're either fighting like hell to be the best or falling like hell with the rest. Unquote. What does fighting like hell look like to you? Well, fighting like hell is constantly pushing yourself up that mountain without fear. You know, so many people are afraid to sort of go for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're afraid to fight for their greatness. You, you got to fight for your own personal greatness. Like no one else is just going to give that to you and give you that crown on your head and say, you're the best. You got to fight for it every single day and everything that you're doing. And it doesn't mean you have to be so locked in that you don't enjoy your friends and family around you. But it does mean every day you're in a fight for your soul. You're in a fight for your spirit. You're in a fight for your existence to be at the very, to be the very best and to be the very best, be the very best version of yourself. You know, it doesn't mean you got to be at the top of the championship circle every time, but you got to fight for yourself every day. You know, the world's kind of an interesting place because, you know, when you're a child, I heard this quote, right? And I heard this, this story and it made a lot of sense to me. When you're a child and you're learning how to walk, everyone's cheering you on. Everyone's everyone's trying to get you. So it's like, you know, when you're crawling, it's like, oh, you can do it. You get up. And then you take another step. You take a crawl and everyone's cheering you on to be able to do that and take those steps. But if that paradox flips when you become an adult, it's like when you're 29 years old and you're running fast, you know, there are a lot of people in our business that are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, they didn't want me running too fast. Right. Right. And so you feel that kind of energy. Um, and I think it's just important to understand that, like, you're fighting for that. You're fighting for the spot that you have. You know, we got two microphones in front of us. There's somebody fighting for the spot that we have that, that are having a chance to watch this. And so just really understanding that, you know, everything we're doing is competitive in nature and everything that we want to do. Like, every job in basketball is a dream job. You know, there's some fans sitting in the stands that wanted the job at Mount St. Mary's that didn't have the opportunity to get that, to get opportunity to get that job, right? So, um, you know, just understanding that we're, we're, li we're in a dream. We're living a dream right now. Some of the things that we get to do. And so I just want to fight like hell. And I want the people out there that follow me to know that's got to be the mindset. And if we're all pushing ourselves forward to be the very best we can, let's fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, when you start falling like everybody else, you know, the reason why. And you know, the great analogy there, we're talking about being a little kid and, and crawling and trying to get walk and all those people cheering you on. And you use the you know example of when you're a 29 year old coach and, and people want you to slow down, but there's also a lot of people that wanted success for you when you're younger, like crawling. But when you get older and you get into the coaching or the business world, there's a lot of jealousy and a lot of people that are, aren't rooting you on like before. And you know, and, and unfortunately, we live in you know a negative society in many cases that the people you know just have that mindset. They don't want some people to succeed. Yeah, it's easier to it's easier to to cheer and root for someone on the on the decline than it is for them on the on the incline right uh and that's just sort of the nature of it i mean you think of any it, what's beautiful the beautiful part about it is storytelling is storytelling always starts off either you're at the top and then you're in the middle you drop and then you find a way to figure it out at the end or 
or you're at the bottom at the beginning and the whole movie is about fighting forward and getting to the top or showing great resiliency. That's the beautiful beauty, beauty of storytelling. And you sort of see that in the way our media portrays athletes or people or leaders uh, you know, they really want a villain because a villain makes it easy to tell a story and it's easy. It's easier if the villain is a fallen hero. Uh, you know, when you look at any of the Marvel movies, like half the villains are fallen heroes that were once meant to be good. And now they are destined to be bad. Right. That just makes for great storytelling. And, you know, when your job and your responsibility is to write a story every single day, uh, you, you, you probably need a villain, you know, you need that. And, um, but like you said, I had a ton of people that were cheering and a ton of people that stand by me and I stand by a ton of people. And, you know, I love that process. You know, I think there's so much room for us all at the top of this thing. I agree. There's so much goodness out there that we can share with others. So I love being a part of that. And I love standing for that. And, you know, some guys get driven off like negative motivation, but, but Michael, that's just not me, man. You know, like, you know, I believe there's enough room at the top of the mountain for all of us. And I think, you know, if I got to slide over and make some room for somebody and they can slide over and make some room for me, I think there's more room for somebody else. And I think that's great. You know, anything that's been achieved has usually been done alongside other great men and women that are pushing the same direction, that are learning in the same direction. So let's open up a lot of space to allow that that process to be able to happen. Uh, you know, again, I had a lot of people cheering me on. I still have a lot of people cheering me on, but I'm a big cheerleader as well. And I'm cheering for a lot of people. And uh, you know, I, I, you'll see on my Twitter all the time. I say, cheer for your friend's success is louder than your own. And I really believe that. It's funny you said that. Cause I, I just posted something about a week ago on, on Facebook. It said, if you're not clapping for your friend's successes and then there for them, when they have a failure, then you're just another person in their life. Yeah. Like what, you know, to me, like, like I've always wanted, you know, there's a couple of life principles I think are, are important to me. You know, number one, is, um, you know, I, I want to be the person when you're struggling the most that you feel like you can reach out to. I enjoy being that person for other people. And um, you look at how many times people don't don't have someone, don't feel like they have someone. Uh, I think it's important to be that person. I love being that person. I have so many people that reach out to me when they're in their toughest times. And I try to do the best I can to help them um, get into a place where they can go and be successful and figure out what they need to do next. You know, secondly, I would say I love giving people more than what they expected. Like if you hire me to do a job, I'm going to try to give you more than what you expected. I think any of these places we worked, including GW, that when we left, they really recognized a lot of the other things we were doing that were making that organization better. Um, now, we've won a lot of places and done that part, too, on the floor. And I'm not saying that's not important, right. but I think trying to enhance other people's lives and caring about others and, and doing a lot of the little things I think are really important. And so those are two of the life principles that I, I really try to live by. Um, you know, and hopefully that, that kind of shows out in my life. You know, you talked about your six years at Mount St. Mary's and you went to two NCAA tournament appearances and you also got a first four win in, in 2017. You're known for your mayhem defense. Tell the audience a little bit about the mayhem defense, what it means and, and how it helped you turn the program around there. Well, you know, mayhem was all about it, creating an energy in a building that the opponents weren't able to handle. You know, we had a great fan base. We had the, we also had the top attendance at the Mount while we were there. We're seeing how we flipped the attendance in one year. You know, it's just an exciting brand of basketball that people want to be a part of. And, you know, we're pressing and trapping on the floor and doing all those things and taking a lot of threes. And, you know, I mean, it's a fun way to play, but it's so much bigger than just the guys on the floor. It's about building a connectivity with your community. Uh, giving them a rallying cry, something they can follow behind, something they can believe in, something that they can love, something they can support. Um, and so Mayhem gave, gave us that kind of a pointed approach, a pointed focus that allowed our team to go and attack it, but allowed our fan base to know where we're going to be at, allowed our fan base to know what to expect from us. I think when you look at the best environments in college basketball, they all have a focus and an intensity. I think it's our job as a, as the head coaches, organizations, to make sure we give that fan base an intensity and a focus were able to do that. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, people hated coming in and playing against our pressing and trapping and playing in, playing in our environment. Again, you know, the, the number of sellouts we were able to have with Mount St. Mary's and Siena and you know, that stuff's exciting. You know, that's when you bring in, you know, when the show comes to town, we got to perform. And I felt like we did a great job of, of being great showmen, but being great members of the community and, and really giving them something to be really excited about. When you talk about that atmosphere, it sort of reminds me of the early 90s, the uh, Nolan Richardson, Arkansas team, the 40 minutes of hell, Todd Day, Oliver Miller, Ron Heary, those guys in, in the same kind of atmosphere that they had there. Yeah, You know, no one talks about Nolan Richardson enough. I mean, 
have have there has there been t- be- ten better basketball coaches than Nolan Richardson in the history? Of Not the that I can think of. Um, he was awesome, right? I mean, I, I'm saying ten just to be generous there. You know what he was able to do at Arkansas, what he was able to do at Tulsa, and these other places as a head coach, the way he was able to change the trajectory of those programs and put them on the national stages, people just don't do. You know, a lot of people walk into jobs like Kansas and they're like already, you know, you walk into Kansas or Carolina, you're winning. You know, Duke, right. you know, John walked into Duke, he's eight in the country already, right? Um, and and that, that's not a diss to anyone. But to do what Arkansas was able to do by building that program up to that national level, national championship level, keeping those great Arkansas players at home, man, I, I mean, I don't think Nolan gets enough credit. I mean, he's a guy that I used to watch the 40 minutes of hell, 30 for 30. I would watch that probably 10, 12 times a year because I just loved watching his energy with the players and being who he is. And, you know, I just, I think he's such an underrated head coach uh, for what he was able to do and how he was able to do it being himself. um, I just, I mean, I have a lot of respect for Nolan Richardson because I just feel like he was just, man, he was, he was really good. Teams played really hard, but he represented for black coaches something really unique something really different and he did it in a place that you know he did it in the south which is different you know we all know that and he did it at a time where how he was operating wasn't always seen as lovely if he was in this day and age he would have been revered forever right which is interesting but part of the reason that coaches like that are revered now is because of what he went through and he took a lot of the heat that allows us coaches now to coach the way that we're able to coach and to be the way we're able to be so I just have a lot of respect for Nolan Richardson. I think he is just an unbelievable head coach and, and an unbelievable leader. And, you know, I have a great appreciation for what he had to go through for us to be able to do what we do now. Coach, you said, quote, those who steal your energy are enemies. Prioritize, prioritize accordingly, unquote. How do you keep yourself from getting involved with, you know, those kinds of people and keep yourself, you know, in a positive frame of mind? Yeah, you know, you know, in the South, we always say, God bless your heart. You know, so so there's a lot of God bless your hearts uh, when you're just interacting with people that aren't at the same energy level. You know, like, you know, I'm like a, I'm a super positive person. I, I love again, we talked about a little bit before. I love cheering people on and helping people become the very best they can become. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't have some friends or some associates. I wouldn't call them friends, some associates who go through tough times and I don't stand there with them and for them. But there always comes a time period where it's like, hey, listen, man, here's what we've got to do. And here's what you've got to do. And you've got to make a commitment to being at your best. You know, like, you know, us sitting around here and complaining about something in the past or something that, uh, you know, something that isn't important. Like I always, I always say you got to own your happiness and you got to own your story. And when you own those two things, then you own your energy. And I think owning your energy is everything. You know, energy, energy moves from one person to another. So, you know, so having my energy and, and keeping my energy at the right place to do what God intends me to do, which is help others and serve others, is everything. And so you can't afford to just be be ha- haphazard with your energy, giving it away to other people that don't necessarily need it, necessarily want it, or want to give it to others. You know, that's a special quality that, that people are able to have. So you want to control that energy. Um, that's how I think it's really important to know who you are. And, and that for me, like I'm not letting anybody steal my energy. I'm not any, letting anybody steal my steal my fire. If you play for me, we're gonna have fun every day. I'm gonna laugh and joke with you every day. And if you can't do that, then you probably can't play for me. Uh, you got to find someone else who maybe doesn't enjoy life as much as I do. You know, after coaching St. Mar- Mount St. Mary's, you went to Siena and you coached there for a year and led that 2018-19 team uh, that was you know 18 eight and 24 record the year before to 17 wins, one of the most improved teams in the nation. In 2019, George Washington came calling, and you said, quote, I loved the challenge of things. I'm excited for that challenge, unquote. What was the most challenging part of the job in your three years there, and what did you learn most about yourself? All of it was challenging. Uh, you're in a great league. You're in a place that that has had some basketball success over the last 20 years, but it's been inconsistent. Um you know, it was a challenge. You know, I mean, we came into Siena and kind of hit everything perfectly. We had great players there. We turned it around. Those guys were hungry to learn, hungry to improve. You know, you know, GW was just a different task. It was a different job. Um, you know, academic, which was great. You know, I, you know, one of the things that people understand with you know, everyone always say to you, like, you know, they say, Jamie, and, you know, if you could coach anywhere, where would you coach? 
you know, and I would say like, you know, Duke or, you know, I'd give different ones, but GW was always third on my list. Hmm. Like I've always wanted to coach at GW and I got a chance for three years to coach at a place that I dreamed of coaching when I got into coaching. And how many times do you get to do that? Uh, you know, lot. like, I mean, how many chances you get, how many times you get a chance to coach at a place that's finished top 10 in the country. You just don't get those kind of opportunities. And, and I wanted that opportunity. You know, we talk about being challenged and, you know, doing that. I mean, I love challenges. I love going into places that are really tough. I mean, I get Mount St. Mary's because it was a rebuild. I got to see it because it was a rebuild. Right. I got George Washington because it was a rebuild. So I'm not afraid to go into the lion's den and, and, and battle it out with whatever weapons that I have in front of me. I can say that about myself. And a lot of people are, a lot of people won't take that kind of risk, that kind of challenge. I always want to be there. I think it's an unbelievable school. I think it's an unbelievable place. I think it plays in a great league. Um, you know, it was challenging. I think the most challenging part, if I had to pick one or one or two things, um, you know, we, I just don't think we had enough time to get it to the level that I thought we'd be able to get it to. You know, when you look at uh, the A-10, how good a league it is, and I thought we were really competing well and doing our parts we needed to do. But I always tell my guys, this is not a self-exam. So you don't get to, at the end of it, go, oh, well, you know, I got an 88. You know, the professor makes a decision on the exam, and they give you a, they give you a grade. And, and our professors there didn't think our grade was good enough, and they make a decision that they feel like they need to make. But, yeah, you know, I just felt like for what we wanted to do and how we were able to do it, you know, we just didn't have enough time. Uh, when you look at these other, what's crazy is this, Michael, is Mount St. Mary's and Siena, we went in with really good game plans to to build and to be able to adapt on the fly. But we never made those game. We never made decisions based on having to win that season. Every decision we made was based off the the strength of the organization and where we needed to be at. And because of that, we stuck with that kind of focus. We were able to turn it pretty quickly, which is really exciting. Um, at GW, it was just different. I mean, from day one, you know, I mean, I want to say I was there two weeks. It was like you got to win next year. You got to win. You know, it was just like this incredible, unrealistic expectation and. I felt like, hey, you know, we could build this into a top 15 team every year, but it wasn't going to happen overnight. It was going to take some time. And when you take over a job like that or any of these jobs are really tough, um, the first thing you have to do, I mean, you have to build trust in the market, right? It's like, and and, and the basketball market is different. It's not, it's not, you know, like if Coca-Cola brings out a new product and the product's bad, they just reel it back and they still have, you know, they have Coca-Cola that they make money off of. So they can take a they can take a test drive on something if it's if it's bad, they just bring it back. I mean, look at Taco Bell. They ruin their breakfast menu. They they cut it back. They move back to something very simple. I'm sure they're doing pretty well. And so our plan was simple. You I mean, number one, we wanted to build trust in the market. How do you build trust in the market? It's by getting people to campus and spending time with them and kind of letting them know the plan, letting them know it was a safe and secure place. We did have some turmoil at GW a few years before I was there, and that there was definitely um res, there was definitely residue of that. You know, when we when we arrived there, you just didn't have players that trusted the coaches. You just didn't have players that trusted the administration. So you're trying to rebuild trust. I thought we did a really good job of building that trust up. And and so that job about trust in the market. We wanted people to trust that they could bring their that they could drop their sons off, drop their best players off in the in the heart of DC and know that we we're gonna take care of them, that we we're gonna fight for them every single day to be at their very best. Really confident that we we're able to build that kind of trust. Um, with the kind of players we had started to get, especially in year three. Um, you know, finally, we were kind of getting guys that were, you know, Brown Freeman is all all the A-10 freshmen, right? So, I mean, that's what you need to have a chance to go there. And we started getting some transfers that could really, really play and trying to put it all together. So, you know, we started to show signs of building trust in the market. You know, number two, we wanted to create, a, we wanted to create an environment that was all about learning and improving. Um, when you look at the very best programs, they have this ability to learn and then attack, learn, then attack. Um, you know, when you base everything based off results right away, you're not going to get the result. Number one, you're not going to get the results that you want. You know, uh, you know, Richmond had six, five, fifth year guys, six year guys that won a lot of games. Right. So we weren't going to get those results right away, but it didn't mean that we couldn't be a little bit better. And I recognize that we could have been a little bit better. So those are a couple of things I think were challenging. Um, it's just not having the time and just knowing that we weren't going to have the time. You know, it's not like, you know, we were fired after year three and we would take the COVID months out. It was only really 31 months that we were with our team. So we didn't even get uh, three full years with our team. You know, when you take that out, you know, you just say, you know, I think we pushed it as far as we could push it in that amount of time. You know, God created a pandemic. God created an insurrection. God created masks we had to wear every day in practice. So, 
you know, it was different. You can't control everything. And, and again, because I love giving energy and I love caring about people. I look at the guys in that locker room that I feel like we did a great job with and we cared about and they care about us. And sometimes the results just aren't good enough. And, and so you got to own that as well. Rafael Nadal said, quote, be humble enough to accept the process, unquote. You commented on that and said it, it's so good. It deserved to be repeated and said louder. What's accepting the process mean to you? Accepting the highs and lows. And the process for Rafael Nadal, I mean, people don't remember. I mean, at the beginning of his career, they said he could only play on clay courts. Like he's just a clay court player. Right. He's never going to get beyond playing on clay courts. Only win the French. Right. Only win the French, right? And that's what he said about Rafael Nadal. You know, now we're watching him as one of the greatest tennis performers in the history of the game. And so it just goes to show that, you know, the process has highs and lows. The process has these little checklist things that you have to try to work through. It's not always going to be a straight, you're not always going straight to the top. You know, very few do that. You, know, you look at a few icons that have been able, a few icons. I mean, you can't even talk about Kobe, Michael Jordan, Andre Agassi. Um, you know, you talk, any of these guys, none of these guys went straight to the top. You know, Michael I mean, only got Magic Johnson pretty close. Right. I mean, he went straight to the top right away. But the you know, majority of these guys and the majority of us, the majority of people, it, you're going to struggle at some point of it. And, and, and that process about owning that struggle, if you deflect in that moment of struggle, you will never you will never succeed beyond that. If you accept it and own it, you've got a chance to use it as like a as like a stilt to get higher. That's a big part of the process. The process like. In the process isn't just oh you know we're we're I'm gonna keep getting better every day and there there's not gonna be any standstills and we're gonna keep it and I'm gonna be you know we're gonna be fifth in the East today and then in two years from now we'll be second and then we'll then we'll win the championship in year it doesn't work that way right. uh, but owning that part of the process I think is really important and and when you really listen to the great speak you know they have a clarity on that process that oftentimes fans or administrators or owners sort of miss. You know, it's crazy because in sport, you have these owners who are wealthy. And I'm pretty sure they didn't wake up one day at 18 years old and they were just wealthy. Maybe some of them, you know, I mean, Jeff Bezos was selling books out of his out of his garage at one point. Um, so I'm pretty sure that they it wasn't Amazon overnight. Right. When you're building a team, it's not going to be built overnight. You're not going to buy yourself into a championship because there's other components that go into a team dynamic that are really important. And that process of a team dynamic and learning how to work with one another, and a big part of that learning how to work with one another is losing. How are we going to respond to losing? How are we going to respond to winning? How are we going to respond to, to contracts? How are we going to respond to NIL? Any of those things are a big part of the process. And, um, you know, I, I just love that, you know, from Rafael Nadal because people forget now he could only win the French. And that obviously wasn't very true. You know, my favorite Rafael Nadal moment, you know, he had such passion, energy, and determination on the court, obviously still does, even his age. But it was 2019, he won the U.S. Open. Uh, it was late August of 2019. And in the ceremony following, I remember him being handed a check at center court for $3.6 million in him folding the check up and sticking it in his shorts pocket. And I was like, oh my God, he has so much money. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, just such a moment. I was like, wow. Well, you know, what's great with the best athletes, and this is, this is so interesting. I mean, I almost started saying I'm like a, a person who's like an expertise in sport because I essentially just study sport and, and not just basketball, but the mindset of tennis players or, or golfers. And I study all that stuff because I love it. So I was going to, I was throwing around the other day, like, man, I should say I'm an expert in sports, but they don't do it for the money. Right. Right. Like that's the hardest thing is that when you do it for the money, you do it for you, when you do it for some external reason, you plateau, you know, you reach a point of success and you can't get over it. But when you do it because you love doing it, when you do it because you love competing, when you're doing it because you're trying to be the best version of yourself, and you're dying for that challenge of how good can I be? You don't do it for the money. You don't do it for external reasons. They become simple byproducts of the process that you've accepted as a competitor. That's when it's magical. Right. When the money is, when, when $3.6 million is a folded check into your shorts. Yeah. And you're really excited about having a chance to get back on that court the next day after winning the championship. Quote. 
the best make others better and they do so because they care deeply unquote that's a great quote of yours um you've coached many players in your career so far what are the most important things that you do as a coach outside of your words that let your guys know how much you care about them man our cultures are so different uh you know when people would transfer into our teams they would be shocked at our cultures and how we operated you know last year you know, we spent the first two weeks only talking about our way of life and how we operate here, call it our onboarding process to, to being successful. It includes reading. You know, we read uh, Legacy last year. We've read Energy Bus by John Gordon, who's a good friend of mine. We've just, every year we've kind of, we've done it a little bit differently. I actually have a workbook that I use um, that just tries to show extremes amount of care Right. I never want our players to feel like they don't have someone to talk to, either me or our staff. So we make that a big point that we're all working on this together. And working on this is not basketball. We're working on this life together. You know, one of the best things that can happen is, you know, the guy gets married, he's got a few of his teammates standing beside him, you know. But I think a more realistic situation is, you know, 20 years from now, one of these guys graduates, they're in a really tough spot. They don't know what to do with something and they know they can pick the phone up and they've got someone that's going to answer the phone for them. That's going to be there for them. Now that's the real test of whether, whether all this worked or not, all the winning, all the losing, all the meetings, the real test is what do those guys feel like they have someone they can connect with and talk with. Um, and so, you know, kind of a long winded answer is we just care about them. We care about them and we make that care known from the very beginning. You know, if you don't want to be cared for, don't play for me because I'm not going to allow you to come in every day and not be at your very best. And, um, and we're going to do it in the right way. You know, they always, it's funny because the transfers are like, well, you know, you can yell at me coach. And I'm like, no, I'm going to yell at you if you're not doing right on the floor. But I think it's important to know that when you're not doing right, when you're not doing right on the floor, you can still walk in this office. Like my relationship with you, it, it has, it's, it's two, twofold. It's basketball coach. But it's also a person who your parents dropped off with you for me to, for me to help grow and mold. And so you can walk in this office every single day and it's going to be like, you didn't go over 10 yesterday. It's going to be about, you know, what, what can I do to help you be to become the best version of yourself? And we really fight for that. So the cultures are very different. You know, you're either in a transactional, you know, relationship or you're in a transformative relationship. Um, I'm not trying to say we're completely transformative because I think that's a heavy word, but I do believe we're in the process of helping people learn who they are. You're dealing with young people between 17 and 22 years old. Right. They don't know who they are yet. The world has only seen them as one thing as basketball players. The world has only given them one commodity. You can play basketball. That's it. I'm trying to help these guys learn their power as a person, as a man. We really fight heavy to help them do that. You worked with a uh, former LSU basketball coach, Will Wade, during your one season at, at VCU. You guys were assistants together, and you said of him, quote, Will and I work on different schedules. He is an early morning guy, and I'm a late night guy. There were many times we were passing in the early hours when we both worked at BCU, but his respect for how people worked is something that I always admired. Do you, did, did you contribute to the success of the team? Did you challenge him to be the best? He loved the two things. He, he loved their two things and loved people around him that upheld him. Will, thank you for showing me that there are always different journeys to get to the destination, unquote. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the coach Wade that you know. Well, I mean, I love Frank. I love Frank. I love I love Will. I mean, Will is he's a hardworking guy who's found his way in this game of basketball. You know, I think it's important to recognize that when you're in hoops or any level of you know when you're on TV, people see you one way, and sometimes we portray something one way. But I got a chance to really know who he is, and. I mean, he was outstanding to me. When I took the job at VCU, I didn't know if him and I would connect like that. And he's a guy that I just love him every day. I love him for who he is. You know, he loves me for who I am. I mean, I've got some faults and weaknesses. I'm sure he's got some faults and weaknesses. But, you know, the reality of it is when you love somebody and you care about somebody, you accept those things and you work with them on the things that they're working on and their battles become your battles and, you know, you know and, and their successes become your successes. And, I've always tried to be that kind of friend for, for Will, but for everyone. And, you know, he's a guy who was a manager that was over like 350 pounds or something at Clemson. And he's turned himself into one of the best coaches in this game by the time he was 40 years old. People just don't do that. They just don't have that kind of success story, being a manager, being a non-player, being able to be that successful at three different places. 
people just don't do that. And it takes some uniqueness and some, and, and, and I appreciate who he is and how he's been able to, to climb the ranks the way he's been able to. And, um, you know, and to me, he's always been a great friend. You know, if I need, if I needed something, you know, if he needed something, who can you call? You know, we talked about that with the teammate. Well, he knows he can always call me and I'm, I'm going to give him the truth. He's going to give me the truth. And, and we're going to all know it's coming from a great place. You know, when you go through that championship level atmosphere, you know, you have these different challenges that happen and those connections, those bonds stay, stay for a long time. Um, I'm really proud. You know, I got to know him well at VCU and I'm really proud of how much more work we've done as friends since then. You know, you're looking at, shoot, I mean, 10, 11 years, 12 years now. You know, we well, we probably talk at least once every two or three weeks, and and again, he watches my games, I watch his games, and and uh, you know when he had his struggles, I was there with him when he was struggling, trying to be there for him, and and the same thing with me. And I just think, you know, sometimes we're portrayed one way. There's probably some some truths to some of the ways we're portrayed. Sometimes they're not, but you know your relationship with someone I think is is different when you get a chance to really get to know them. And I'm not just reading on the headlines or reading what they're saying about them on ESPN, right. you know, because I recognize that. You know, they're trying to sell. They're trying to sell. They're trying to sell newspapers. They're trying to sell magazines. They're trying to sell ads. Um, you know, luckily in friendship, I'm not trying to sell anything. We're just trying to be there for one another. You know, when talking about the virtues that every successful college basketball program must have, you said, "quote Negative vibes must exit the room. Only enthusiasm, the kind that's infectious and illuminating. And if there's a blemish, acknowledge, address, improve." move forward, unquote. You know, coach, throughout my life, I've heard from several of my mentors and, and repeated the words many times, enthusiasm is contagious. You know, we've all had blemishes in our lives. Uh, how have you been able to go through that process and move forward despite those obstacles? Well, you know, I have some tough days as well. Um, you know, just like anybody else, you know, I'm not um, but I, I do think in general, my perspective is just everything we're going through. N- number one, I'll, I'll, number one, I'll say this. I feel like the person that we are, we're built for the challenge that's ahead. So I try to have great ownership over me. You know, I, I own me, I own, own, the, I own my energy. So I think having great ownership over me and not allowing someone to take my energy away, um, I think is really important. Um, enthusiasm is such a weapon. You know, I remember being in games, and I'm going against some of the best coaches in the game, Hall of Fame coaches that we've had a chance to beat or be in the game with, and just thinking, man, his enthusiasm's off today. Like, I can win this game just with my enthusiasm, control this crowd, control this game. And, and I remember watching, looking, and maybe that seems a little juvenile, but we were able to win and compete and play great because our team was able to have more enthusiasm and have more fun. Enthusiasm is such a weapon that – Negative people try to drown out. You know, like I was playing pickup yesterday. And I'm like, when I play pickup, I'm enthusiastic. I'm having a great time. I'm clapping hands. I'm, I'm dapping you up. I mean, I'm in a great place. I'm getting a chance to play. I don't know. I'm getting older. I don't know how many more games I got left to be able to play. I'm going to enjoy everyone. I'm going to get a chance to play. And and I said to one guy, I said, I said, man, let's just take a deep breath, man. Let's go and attack this thing. And he responded negative. He was on my team. He responded negative to me. Right. And so. And so then we go down one more time. And I say, hey, man, we're on the same page, man. We're, we're working on the same thing together. And he was like, hey, you know, I'm just frustrated. And so then the next moment, boom, I'm just frustrated. I'm like, man, you're playing great defense. We're doing after it like this. And then he goes, oh, you know what? Yeah. And we went on. We end up winning the day or whatever. And we really built a relationship quickly just because I didn't respond with the same energy he brought to me, right? I brought my enthusiasm to him, and I was like, you make him respond to my enthusiasm. And I think you'll be amazed at how many times that when you bring your enthusiasm, you lead with that, and you don't allow someone to drown your enthusiasm, they don't really have a choice but to meet that or step away from it. You know, oftentimes when you walk into a conversation, the energy that you bring into that conversation as the person who initiates it, usually the, the meeting or the conversation will stay at that level. All right. So trying to stay at that level and recognizing that enthusiasm is such a weapon, you know, I mean, I, I always talk about enthusiasm, you know, nothing's ever been great achieved without enthusiasm. I mean, that's a, that's a really popular quote. It's really hard for people when things get tough to, to fall back on that. I try to fall back on enthusiasm, try to find hope in the moment, try to find hope in what's next and keep believing. Again, one of the things when you own yourself and you own your story, there's always hope to take one more step. And enthusiasm is sort of like that that gasoline in my step that I try to live with every day 
you know, when you walk in the building with me, I'm knocking on the door. I'm saying good morning. I got a big smile on my face. Doesn't matter what happened. And, and I think, you know, our players over time here at GW and every place I've been, they really appreciate that kind of, that kind of mindset uh, of having enthusiasm as a weapon um, instead of whatever else everybody else uses. Jamie and aims to create a level of transparency with everyone he works with and aligns those around him to reach elite team status, quote, becoming the best that we can be while you're becoming the best you can be, unquote. Your podcast, Last Call with Jamie and Christian, powered by Speakeasy Sports. Tell us a little bit about it and uh, what it's like for you, a coach, talking to other coaches and interviewing them. I, I love sharing people's stories and I love hosting. Uh, I'm having a blast doing this. I'm a communications background. I had three newspaper jobs coming out of college, so I could have jumped right into the world of media. Um, I went into coaching right away, worked for a great guy named Bob Johnson, and and that changed my life. But I'm really enjoying this chance to, to share people's stories. You know, I think there's so many unique things that are going on in people's lives, and I think there's so many different ways to impact. Um, I'm really enjoying it, having a great time, being on this side of it, asking all the questions, um, and just trying to learn a little bit more. You know, I, I really had this mission this year you know, this will be my first year out of college basketball since with this is my first year not playing basketball, coaching basketball since I was maybe in the fifth or fourth grade. Wow. Right? So that's a long period of time. I don't even want to put the years on it, but that's a long period of time. And, you know, when I walked out that door at GW, I closed that door and I looked back at it and I just said, like, I'm closing that chapter in my life in terms of whatever happened here is going to stay here. Um, and then I made a commitment to myself. And I think commitments to yourself are really important. I think you have to recommit yourself consistently, but I think a commitment to yourself and a commitment to myself was I'm going to make sure that I learn everything I need to learn so I can continue to go and be the very best I can be and whatever God intends for me to be. Um, and it wasn't to look back on it with, with fear, or anger, or embarrassment. There's no embarrassment because I'm a learner. I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning. I enjoy learning. Um, and so I'm taking this opportunity, this opportunity to learn. You know, I get a chance now to talk to all the people I want to talk to and ask them all the questions I ever wanted to ask. And I just have this great faith about being able to do that. It's going to allow me to be the very best. You know, I, I put this personal statement, mission statement about eight years ago, and it, and it goes like this. I'm going to be one of the best who's ever done this. I just have to be comfortable with it not looking like something someone else has done before. And so, what you know, I wrote that eight years ago when I was, you know, we had just won the NCAA tournament or whatever, and, uh, and, and it and it, it's a great mission statement because it applies to me now as a fired head coach, as a guy who's had some failure. It's, there is no, you know, in, in being a learner and being someone who's really driven, uh, there is no failure in that. I just got to learn the things that I need to learn. This platform has allowed me the opportunity to learn a ton. I always say, you know, listen, what do they say? Listen, uh, listen, share and interact. Um, so I'm a, I love when people are able to do that. I'm getting great feedback from it. It's been a lot of fun being able to be on this side of the microphone and and to, to really listen to some of the very best share their stories. So as much as you love your podcast, are, are you itching to get back into coaching sometime soon? I mean, I love coaching. I'm going to be back in coaching. Um, you know, there's going to be one athletic director out there next spring. I'm pretty sure it's going to say, you know, we want this guy to be our head coach. You know, yeah. we want this guy leading our team and building our program. And I got a lot of faith in that. There are not a lot of 40-year-old coaches running around here with an NCAA tournament win, two two trips to the state tournament, changing two programs around for, for plus nine and plus 10 wins in the first season that can get out there and then fire up a fan base the way that I believe that I can and that done. So, um, you know, I, I've got good faith that that'll happen in, in April, March or April. And if it doesn't, you know, we'll, we'll continue to find the things that we need to do best. If that's not in the plan, that's not in the plan. Uh, but I'm like really enjoying what I'm able to do. And again, I think it's just all about learning. You know, I, I've, you know, one thing I've never done is I've never put a timeline on anything. Uh, you know, when I started out coaching, I I never said, oh, I want to be a head coach by the time I was 30. I never said I want to be a head coach. You know, that wasn't even one of my things. My thing was I just wanted to help a team and organization out. And that's what we just tried to do every year. And then, you know, something came calling for me at the age of 29. Um, I got that kind of faith that if I keep the great, keep the same energy and I keep improving and keep learning, I mean, there's so much stuff I can learn. You know, when you're 29 years old and you take over and you kind of get on this on this hamster wheel and you're attacking it and you're improving and you're jumping schools, you know, you miss some things that you could probably get a little better at. And, you know, when you're taking over a rebuilder, you can't waste any days. Um, and so there's not like an opportunity there where if there's something you're not knowing or, you know, to really find the answers around you, I get a chance now to find every one of those answers. And 
figure out where, what I need to do better and what kind of people I need to put around myself. And, um, uh, it's been a great process. It's been a, been a tremendous healing process for me to look deeply into what we did well, what we didn't do well, and really say, you know what, we're pretty good at this basketball thing. And, you know, someone will give me a chance and they're going to be really happy with it. Mental performance coach Greg Raber said of you, quote, I've probably worked with about 20 D1 basketball teams over the years. I've had the honor of working with Jamie and in each of his three head coaching gigs. He does a great job teaching mindset and building a positive team culture. It's impressive. He has a strong commitment to learning, unquote. How has meditation and focusing on mental performance changed your life and, and the players that you've coached? Well, it's everything for me. I mean, you can't be your very best for your players. You can't be your very best as a leader if you're not at your personal very best. And so if I'm carrying baggage in from the days before, the weeks before, if I'm not in a great mental mindset or ready to go and attack it, then, you know, our organization is not going to go very far. And that's just the reality of it. And and so, you know, Greg has been a tremendous friend of mine because, you know, we, we can talk deeply about some of these things and dive in, dive in more with it. And, you know, it's really helped me. I've always been a meditator. My father was like a, you know, he's a black belt in karate and, obviously a, a tremendous athlete. So he's a big meditator. So he had us meditating when we were kids, teaching us how to do that. So I've always had a foundation in it. You know, when you look at all the stress and anxiety that coaches and players go through, it's our job as leaders to build an environment where they have the resources around them to learn how to deal with those things. And we talk about resources. Everybody always talks about resources like it's charter flights or steak dinners or lobster dinners or you know, and those things are important. I'd love to have those in my next spot. So if anybody's listening, you know, don't worry, I'd love to have those. But when I talk when I talk about resources, I really talk about these these very baseline fundamental parts that I think we overlook. Psychological health, psychological well being, um, is at the top of the list for, for me of resources that I think we often overlook in college sports that I think are really important. You know, a nutritionist, you know, those kind of things, teaching people how to eat teach people how to handle their money, financial literacy. Those are things that I think, you know, they eliminate stress and they help people understand, uh, you know, the mistakes that they can make. And so when you talk about mental performance as an athlete, that's everything. You know, if I can look at the glass half empty versus half full, that might be the difference of me having a great day versus a bad day. Right. And it's challenging when you open up your phone and it says, man, this guy can't play basketball or this guy can't coach. And, you know, so if you're not, if you're not building a strong center of self, it's really hard to go be the person that you want to become. Uh, if you're going to constantly be pulling energy from others, um, you've heard me talk so much about energy and owning your energy, but meditation is a way to be able to do that, to be able to take a couple of those moments in, get centered into what's most important, centered into your breath, centered into your well-being, centered into your thoughts of where you want to go and how you want to get there. You, know, you can use meditative practices in a lot of different ways. Greg certainly helped me. He's helped our teams, um, you know, but I've always been a huge proponent in it and, you know, we've been doing it for two, nine, 10 years and, and I've been doing it for a large part of my life because I've, I feel like it's just allowed me to get myself in the right place to go and attack and be my very best. And, you know, maybe that's where the enthusiasm comes from, you know, that I can, that can, that I can get to get centered and then go and attack. You know, and, and meditation and mindfulness, you know, go back a long way in basketball back to, I want to say at least the early nineties with Phil Jackson, you know, the Zen master. And I think he learned it from George Mumford. And, you know, so people sort of back then made a little bit of, of fun of it, but I mean, look, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, they all meditate. They're all into mindfulness and they're some of the, the three best, you know, three of the best basketball players of all time. People often underestimate the level of pressure that's on these guys to perform every single night. And they often underestimate, like they often underestimate that. And I think that's a, a challenge in, as a fan and I've always, I've tried to always have such a healthy respect for the players in what their bodies are going through and what they're going through mentally. You know, it's easy. Someone says, oh, you know, like, you know, when you go, you know, how many people do we work with in the office space where they, you know, they're having a bad day at home and they bring that into the office? You know, I mean, a lot of people do that. That's yeah. not an uncommon thing. You know, this guy's wife's all over him. They've got a newborn. He's got to drop the kids off at school. He's got to work. He's got to get back and pick somebody else up. There's pressure and there's stress. But for some reason, we look at our athletes like they shouldn't have any pressure or stress because they because they because they have money because they're on scholarship. Um, and in a lot of ways, they'll start learning how to deal with some of those things when they get into that to get when they get onto the floor and they're trying to figure that out. So having people around them that allow them to help them to understand 
the way to alleviate some of that pressure and how to reframe it becomes very important. And maybe the most important thing, you know, they're in the NBA, they're in college because they're talented you know, they can make these shots, you know, a nine, at a 95% clip. And so it's not about their talent. It is about just being able to go in there and be the player that you need to be. And you can't do that if your mind, your focus is in the right place to go and attack it. Your mom, Joyce, you said, quote, superhero in every stretch of the word, unquote. Of your dad, John, you said, quote, you're the toughest, most determined and focused person that I know, unquote. And Jarrell, your brother, you said, quote, thank you for showing me what true perseverance looks like, unquote. Tell us a little bit about your family. Man, I mean, obviously I love my family. We all do. Um, you know, my mom was was a, te- a special education teacher for 35 plus years. Wow. So she has like tremendous patience and she was a teacher of the year and all these amazing things. And I, I would get a chance. Yeah, I grew up in the school system. My mom would pick me up after school or drop me off. And so I would spend a lot of time with teachers. I spent a lot of time with my mom going to school and, and, and after, you know, she's got a tremendous amount of patience when she's talking about learning and helping others. And, you know, she loves teaching, love teaching, um, would do it forever. If there wasn't for SOLs, you know, she would have kept doing it. Uh, you know, my dad, you know, really accomplished athlete, but a person who, you know, as an athlete, I mean, he really had an, an electric mindset to go be his very best. He went to Virginia state and division two and, um, was the last guy picked on the team and finished, ended up being the number one player there in the Hall of Fame there and worked himself into that opportunity. You know, one thing that that's that I think is important, you know, my, my parents never, or my dad, he never told us at all about his successes as an athlete. Hmm. I mean, we had to look in his, you know, we, you know, we, when we were probably about nine or 10, we found his, um, we found his scrapbook. And it's the only, and I've never seen him look at it. It's the only way that we really found out how great an athlete he was. You know, he never talked a lot about it, which I think is really unique. You know, I think most people would be bragging about how good an athlete they were, and he just never did that. And I think that's that's just so different. You know, he was just about – that was a phase of his life where he competed in attack. Now, he did do a great job of, of setting a, a, a standard of how you work. You know, like one time I think my mom said he was a little overweight or something. And for like the next three months, he was running like four or five miles a day. Like just, I mean, just like high determination. I think she was joking. She wasn't even serious. But he's just a type of person. You know, you talk about like Kobe and, and MJ, you know, like it was, oh, you're comparing your dad to those guys. Well, he's not those guys, but they have the same kind of mindset. Uh, you know, I don't have that mindset. <laughs> so so I can re- I can appreciate that. Like he can take one slightly maybe negative comment and turn that into a lot of work and then and, and go and attack that. I think that's unique. I can respect that kind of greatness as a coach and as a person, a little hard to deal with as a, as a, as a child, but you know, but you can deal with that as a, as a, as a coach and a person now. And as a man, you respect it a lot more. Um, but he was just like, so this, we have those kind of that foundational point. We'd be at the kitchen table and you know, they never talked about our sport life or what we we're doing at school. They just went back and forth and, they talk so much about how they were trying to help their students. My dad's driver's ed teacher in the district. So he's driving every morning. Every morning he's up at 4.30 in the morning driving driving students. And he's been doing that for years. Um, you know, so he's get, he's up at 4.30 and he's home at, at 7 after practice every single day. Um, you know, so, you know, just watching that kind of work and that kind of way they attacked it was just so different how they worked together to make sure that we were happy and that we recognized that there, there was nothing going on that we were in a good place. You know, you just got a lot of respect for that. And then when you look at my brother, you know, my, my, my younger brother, he hates when I call him my little brother. Um, but, you know, just, just watching him in this game of basketball, you know, he goes, plays division three, you know, he went to, went to Norfolk state first for a year, tried to walk on there, wasn't able to walk on there. It transfers to play for me at Emory and Henry division three school. And, works himself into a, the starting lineup there and becomes a pretty good player, pretty good role player at Emory and Henry. Besides, he wants to get into coaching, takes a job at Tusculum as a volunteer, making nothing, um, you know, and, and then comes back over to Emory and Henry as an assistant, making a little bit, and then the next year makes a little bit more. Uh, then goes to Randolph-Macon, makes basically nothing at Randolph-Macon as a second assistant, you know, like he's just had such a resilient journey, you know, to, to where he is today, working with the Boston Celtics and, you know, the GM for their for their G League squad and doing some player development for the Celtic squad. 
you know, so I just love that, that he has great resiliency, you know, and, you know, I haven't had to maybe have that level of resiliency. My path is pretty quick, but he's fought for where he stands. And so I always tell him like when he's in tough times, it's like, you know, man, you made yourself, man, you made yourself, you're going to be all right. And he's done it in a way where his players, when he coached them, really have a great respect for him, how he interacts with them, how he teaches them. You know, he's, he's done an amazing job. It's been fun watching his journey and, and watch him not give up on his dream. Quote, somehow I got lucky and bumped into you at the perfect time in my life. You're as smart and talented as any person I've ever come across. We laugh and dance after losses, after wins. You make sure that I enjoy our accomplishments. You never let my head get too big, but you also never let me to drop my head too low. You relentlessly lead our family and challenge me to be a better man every day. You're a ray of light towards a better day each and every day we wake aside one another. Allie, thank you for being the soulmate that can walk this journey with me side by side, unquote. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Tell us about that perfect time in your life when you guys met. You know, it, it was, it was we, we had already, you know, it's number one, she's just like such an amazing person. And, you know, I'd been married before. It's my second marriage. I had a son, I had a son with my first wife. And, and so you're kind of coming out of this stretch where, you know, you're trying to figure it all out. I mean, you know, we won a lot of basketball games, so basketball wasn't the issue. We were kind of figuring that part out, but I was still trying to figure out who I was as a, as a man and to have a soulmate, a person that you can connect with so closely. I mean, we just have so much fun together. I mean, the laughter that we have, I mean, everything I put in there is like how we live our life. You know, I mean, you know, she's a, she's about six years younger than I am. And I remember we, we beat Layola one, one year and I don't, I don't typically drink during the season. So I'm like a non, you know, I go dry during the season, but when it's like exam period, um, we'll have a drink or two or whatever. And, and I just remember like we, we get this win and, and, uh, you know, we're feeling pretty good. And she goes, you know, why don't we just do, uh, you know, why don't we do a power hour? You know, <laughs> like, like, you know, just her and I, and I thought, wow, you know, I would never think of this before, you know? And, and so, you know, we do like a small little power hour, but it was more so just a suggestion, uh, just bringing that kind of fun into life where, you know, it's basketball and we love basketball and it's our life. So I'm not trying to say it's not our life. Um, but just having someone that can laugh with you when it's really tough and just be there for you. You know, she's just a beautiful person, um, for me, you know, and, and, and that's exactly the kind of person that I needed to go to the next level as a, as a man, as a coach, I, you know, I couldn't have got to the spots where we've been able to get to without her, without just her being who she is. She's got a bunch of older brothers. She's got, she's got a couple of younger brothers. Like she just fits in perfectly with me. And, and, uh, you know, we don't have to have a lot of friends around to have a good time and, you know, we just, I'm just really fortunate to have a person beside me who I love so dearly. And, uh, you know, she'll pack the house up at a drop of a hat. And I won't complain one bit about it. And, uh, and then she'll kiss me when I get home and, 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 and from, from a tough day of work. And I think so much of our life right now as a coach is like trying to make sure you're surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. And I don't think there's any more important person than your spouse. Your son, Jacoy, quote, you don't know to love until you have a child. The love you have when you hold your child for the first time changes the soul of a person, unquote. You also said, quote, Jacoy, thank you for giving me life and purpose, unquote. Tell us a little bit more about him and how he gave you purpose. Oh, man, it's just the best. Being, being a father is the greatest gift. Um, holding your son. I mean, you, you'll never, you never forget the first time you hold your children. You know, I told my mom, and I have a young, I have a newborn now. I have a five five month old newborn. Congratulations, Jones. thank you. And you know, I told my mom, I was like, I remember the first time I hugged my boys. You know, each time is there's like this spark that you feel. And I asked my mom, I said, did that spark ever go away? And she goes, it never goes away. You know, you have it forever, and it's just amazing to have that with someone. Um, and so he's just this. I mean, he's this. He's a really smart. Everyone loves their kids, so. But, you know, he's just this really smart kid. We have this amazing connection. You know, a large part of our lives he's been in, you know, we've been separate because we've been divorced. And so the way that we've been able to interact, it's been a little bit different. But we're so close and we've always been so close since he was since he was a baby. You know, FaceTimes every night, calls all the time. We've just really found a way to, to be around one another. And part of me moving to Williamsburg this past year, it's just about being able to be with him. And 
being able to be dad. I mean, I love being dad. And when I say I love being dad, I love the discipline of being dad too. It's not just the the playing catch or, you know, doing different stuff. It's, it's about all of it. And um, I've just really enjoyed just being, being his dad and, and laughing with him and joking with him. We just have such a great time. And, um, you know, it's, it's been fun being dad and, and being able to go to baseball games and soccer games and, and uh, you know, he's just, you know, he inspires you because, you know, he's looking at everything you do. You know, it's funny. So yesterday, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of times, I go play pickup yesterday and I brought him with me. You know, he's never really seen me play much. And I said, well, don't you just come with me in the morning. We'll shoot some while we're at the gym, whatever. So he comes over and, and I get, I'm like high enthusiasm talking the whole time, building people up and, and old Ben pick up. Cause that's how I play the game. And, and so we go to a soccer game later that day. And he's like talking crazy, you know. He's talking, having a best day of talk I've ever seen him have. And so afterwards, and they win. He has a shutout. He played played pretty well. And afterwards, I said, "Well, why why were you talking so much?" And he goes, "You know, Dad, when I watch you, you're just always talking. You're just always building people up." And he was like, his talk was, he was building people up, telling people they were doing a good job, and organizing them, and picking people up, and embracing them. Um, and so he said, "You know, always you're always doing that. You're always loud." And you're always picking people up, and 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 he got that a little bit from watching that day and watching me coach, and and I think those are the kind of things when you're a father or you're a parent, you know they're always watching what you're doing, even the little, even the smallest things, and you know so it's an inspiration to try to be the right kind of person for him, the right kind of man for him, because it's going to be in direct correlation of the kind of person he becomes. I can't imagine that moment when he told you that how proud you were. Oh, he's he's the best. He does that. He's good, man. He's a good boy. We're really fortunate. And um, he just has a great, like, perspective. You know, it's different. You know, when you grow up, um, when you grow up in the gym with your dad, your dad being a coach, your parent being a coach, your perspective is different on competing, on playing. Um, you know, and so and one of our podcast things will be about that. Like, what's different when you're in sport versus when you're out? You know, when, when you're when your parents don't understand competing in sport versus when your parents understand competing in sport, um, he has a strong understanding of what it what it looks like to be be a great athlete. Um, and so I think that's like something that we kind of experience all the time. And, you know, yesterday was just one of those things where where he said the right thing and, and he really went out there and exemplified it on the, on the field. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? Uh, you got to love yourself first. If you don't love yourself, if you don't, you don't love who you are and what you're trying to become, and you can't expect other people to know that. You can't expect other people to know who you are, to know your struggles. You know, we look at these guys on TV or these performers, and we think they have everything going on in their lives that they don't have the same kind of issues that we do, and and you know, they're still trying to figure those things out as well. Uh, I think that's been a really valuable thing for me is like, you know, maintaining my confidence no matter what. Um, so I would say loving yourself first and having a deep love for yourself. Uh, I do think it's hard to love others if you don't love yourself. And when I say love yourself, I don't mean uh, arrogance towards yourself. I think true love, you know, love is patient, love is kind. Love also has empathy. Love also forgives. You need to use all those components with yourself so you can go and be the person that you need to be. You, know, you come from obviously a really wonderful family that's taught you so many great things. Um, you, you and Allie have a great life together. You're only 40 years old and, and it's a time where many coaches, you know, first get their first shot at a D one job, but you got yours, you know, talked about 11 years ago, you're 29 at the time. And so you're way ahead of the curve and there's no doubt you're going to be coaching again sometime soon. And cause you, you're going to have a long coaching career ahead of you. You know, uh, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate it. Anytime you need anything from me, I am always here. You know, you can find me at uh, Last Call with Jamie and Christian uh, on all the places where you find podcasts. And, and uh, you know, I love people that want to interact. So find me on Twitter as well at Jamie and Christian. The great thing about my mom, Michael, is she gave me a name that's really unique. So if you start putting Jamie in, in to Google or Twitter or wherever, uh, usually my name pops right up. And I appreciate you giving this platform. I mean, I've really enjoyed our conversation. And if there's anything you need from me, just give a yell. Appreciate it, Coach. Thank you so much. Thank you.